And then after that, I don't want to talk. <laughs> because, you know, like we talk about um, being a keynote speaker. So that means that I have a bunch of keys that I have to, to use so that we can open doors and open spaces and create possibilities. And that's what supposedly a keynote person does, you know, issue that possibility. Um, I think that, you know, uh, some of you should take notes. I hope that some of you take it because I am not going to be giving you statistics because I see how you play with those, all those toys that you have, you know, the, the technology. You can find out numbers very easy. But what I'm going to share with you is the understandings. And that is very important because the word understanding is a very key word is what you're standing over. If you don't have understandings, you don't know what you're standing over, you know? What is it that is going to allow you to move forward? So that is very, very important. So I want to also start with looking at this, because this is very important, you know? And you have a great, a great opportunity that is provided to you by, in this case, the university and really by the resources that people throughout the years and up to now have paid through their taxes so that you can have an opportunity to have the keys, the keys to create whatever you really want to create. So in here, for example, it says International Policy Conference, Securing the Future. I want to work with that. Because many times you come to here, you know, and maybe some of you are coming because you got to. Uh, but some of you might be very glad that you have to uh, when you finish. But, you know, international is a very important word. Because especially throughout, all the time, international is very key. But international can be only that there is many countries, many nations involved in something. But that doesn't mean that they are internationalist. Where you see the difference is internationalism is when we are mindful of all those other nations. And we care, and we think of them before we make choices and decisions, how we talk about them, and what do, how do we support whatever you know, decisions are being made. So international and internationalism is two different things, but you know, Having an international perspective can help you to have an internationalist position. And that is going to guide you in your life. Because forever I was taught internationalism from my mom and my dad. It was not in these schools and in the universities. It was that my father, when I was six years old, got the map of El Salvador and placed it there and taught me about the mountains and the lakes and the river and how we have to take care of that. And here is the sister uh, republic of Honduras to the north. And he would teach me about the north. And here, to, you know, I'm looking at the map. Here to your left is the sister republic of Guatemala, you know. And here on the right is the sister republic of Nicaragua. And here to the south is the Pacific Ocean and that's your brother too. And you have to be mindful and take care of that, you know. And then he taught me, you know, like, see, later on he brought a larger map and he was teaching me about the mountains. So do you know that, for example, from Alaska to Patagonia is the same. It's the Rocky Mountains that are not only yours. It takes them all the way from the north all the way and goes to the whole continent of the Americas. That's why we don't call you Americans in my country, those of us who know better, we call you United States, Estadounidenses. That's who you are. And it's a matter of identity, because when you go around saying American or North American, you know, you don't really know who you are. And this is part of the internationalism, you know, to know where you are in the world and what you are here for. So I was taught that this is a, a range of mountains and what the mountains do. And then he showed me on the other side, in China, you know, you see the other mountains going. And it's the same range, only that, you know, through uh, certain spaces it goes underwater. And, you know, when you see that, you start understanding about the unity, you know, the unity of everything. So I am very, very thankful to have had a father that taught me those things and taught me to read, 
I read the Quixote when I was very little, you know, and I got so involved with it that I would get under the bed with the lamp to read, you know, and then they found out and they had to <laughs> pull me out, you know, and so now they say that that's the reason that I had to wear these glasses because from the very, very little life in me, you know, I was reading classics that were written for kids and, you know, I would go with my father to, to every, every uh, month to the library and he would pick a book for my mom and for himself that they had talked about and I would pick the book for us to read. This is very important, you know, because it's, when we are talking about internationalism, it's a cultural thing, you know. It's not about individualism, but it's about the wholeness. And so my mom taught us very much about the taking care of the planet. And that because every weekend we went and worked in the countryside. So we, when we are talking about sustainability, it's the ability to provide sustenance. Sustenance is what nourishes you. Sustento, we say in Spanish, you know, that which will nourish you and keep you alive and well. So we learn about the seasons and the water and the rain and everything, you know, and that was my mom. So a lot of what I am now, even though I have gone to school and learned and a lot of things, is <coughs> what I learned from them that I am still experiencing and manifesting. When I say manifesting, it's because anything you do, you're manifesting, you know? It's becoming clear and clear in front of you. So that's very important, but you see the reason I also am, I'm telling you this because yesterday I, I arrived to your city and I got the newspaper. You know, this is the uh, Intelligence Journal. And there is this opinion, rise of moral individualism. You know, this is, it has to do with individualism or being a global citizen, you know? And then what kinds of policies are affecting you and how you are part of those policies either is an individualist perspective or is it something that makes you a global citizen and a planetary citizen? <laughs> planetary citizen is the one that understands, a person that understands, and they go together, you know? understands how nature works and you are careful and in awe and with respect to that. You don't just go and exploit. So for example, in my case, it means that in my country when they are uh, cutting the trees or uh, you know, the deforesting or going into mining practices that are very negative for the environment, I take a position even though that might not be what the company is like. And in my country, people are getting killed right now because the, the ounce of uh, gold is close to $2,000 now, you know? What's the purpose of gold? Does it feed you? You know, this woman at the time of colonial uh, empire, you know, said, well, this guy is supposed to know God, and, you know, he's like God, you know, for this. And um, she said, but if he really were like God, he would learn the word corn instead of gold first, and he went kilos for the gold, you see? And so, read your paper, especially the editorials. How many of you read the editorials and discern about it and talk about it? You know, we got to. Is it true that the rise of moral individualism, people don't know if uh, what you're doing is right or wrong. They say, well, it's what you like. Everybody has to have their own opinion. Well, then it goes to, for example, the situation of the G20s. You know what the G20 is? Who can tell the rest of the people the G20? Hmm? Nobody knows about the G20? There are opinions in your papers and news in your paper about the G20. The G20 and, you know, I have prepared something for you that then later on at the end we are going to revamp to just, just before we finish so that you can see a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about. But the G20 is related to the G5, the G7, the G8, and the G193. So the G193 is the community of nations. It's the United Nations, where everybody is supposed to sit down and discern about all kinds of issues and figure out solutions, come to agreements. This is part of the agreements related to women's equality and empowerment, and how that is related to justice and peace. So, it is at the United Nations that is the Commission on the Status of Women, and where they discern that unless there is equality for women, there is no way that we can have a millennium of peace, because it's based on justice. You know, and so you can follow that too. 
that the G20, the, the, the G5, well, those are the people, the countries that are in the Security Council of the UN. We are trying to change that because it cannot be that this G5 determines what has to happen around the world. And they have veto powers, meaning who knows what veto power is. When, you know, there is a, 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 a vote and you can stop it because you are part of the G5. And you say, no. We have to not only reform the UN, but we have to refound the UN. And then you see me, you know, and I look older and, you know, gray hair and all that. Huh, you dare work to refound and reform the UN? Mm -hmm. Yes, and you can do it if you decide to do that. But you have to prepare, you have to study, you have to read, you have to think. You have to have opinion. People who have opinions have character. You know, you can... It doesn't mean that you are perfect and all the time, but it means that you are going to figure out how to deal with things. So, you know, because we keep complaining about these five, then, you know, like they developed the G7, they included two other countries. And then after that, they included another country, so it's the G8. So they will say, the G7 plus one, guess who was the one? And why they decided to bring in it? You know, I'm talking about internationalism, and all this is policy that affects all of us, because whatever is decided there, that's what the governments go and do, or not do. For example, the man today was talking in there. How many of you were at that opening session? Okay, yeah, two or three. What did he say about the International Criminal Court? Hmm? Remember he talked about it? They were talking about the, uh, what? the rule of law. And he said that now, thanks God, we have the International Criminal Court that can deal with all those people that are committing atrocities around the world. You know, genocide, crimes against humanity, like Hitler kinds of things, you know, or the Rwanda situation. But what he didn't tell you is that the U.S. has not ratified, signed, and withdrew the signature has not ratified, has not implemented, is not willing to harmonize the Constitution for that. He should have told you that too, you know? And this is what I'm saying, you know, this is policies. Policies is what determines what is going, you have a policy, you know? You can decide that your policies that you are going to be like to everything and you're not going to get up on that. And you're going to flunk out, that's your policy, the way that you're going to guide your life. Or your policy can be, I am going to be a Baptist or blah, blah, blah. You know, it's, and that's nations, homes, nations, communities, all of them have policies. Your school has policies. Do you know what is the policy on women's uh, equality at the school? Do you know how many, for example, are in administration positions of, uh, you know, decision making? And how many are professors and which kinds of, of, uh, of tracks? You know, that is learning about policy. And so you must be about those things because those are, that's the life that we are giving you. But it's the life also that you are allowing for you to live in. And you can decide if that's what you want for yourselves and for your great-grandchildren because whatever the policy is now is what we are creating for the future. We're manifesting for the future what we do today. Okay? So it's important to have policies. So. You know, then uh, the seven plus one was China, because it got to the point that <laughs> we cannot, you know, you had to deal with Russia, the Soviet Union at the time, but, you know, then you had to do and deal with China. So you, you bring them around the table. But G8 was not good enough, and China was all the time, you know, at a distance. That's why it was seven plus one. And so but we called them G8, the G8, you know. So lately, what happened in the last three, four years? Hmm? Who can tell me what has happened that has made the qualitative difference that forced them to create the G20? G is for group, no? Group. Hmm? Uh -huh. It's very important. That's why you end up, in, end up pay, being able to go to school or getting more loans and interest rates will go higher and people are losing their houses and people have lost their jobs. The financial and economic crisis. Who knows the difference between financial and economic? You have to know that there is qualitative difference there. That's policy again. And international for that sake. Because you see, right now they are talking very scared about in the financial and economic situation. What is it that they are talking about right now? 
that is so dangerous? Who can tell me? It's about Greece, and it's about Italy, and it's about Spain, and it's about Ireland. And really, when they're saying all that, you know, and the Germans are very upset about it, and they have to figure out what to do. And there is an article in your paper yesterday that's talking about when countries lose their currency. That's policy, an international policy. And then these people here can tell you a lot of what I'm talking about. So you flunked the day if you didn't study your editorials and discuss them and took a position. You flunked the day, even if you got an A in whatever quiz they gave you. <laughs> yes, flunked out. Oh, everything is being shaped for you and you don't even have an opinion. I'm sorry to be so long, but you know, like you won't help me again, and maybe they won't invite me again after I say, well, this thing is that's okay. <laughs> From this wife, and I do a lot of work with lots of people, but you have to know about this, you know. And so, it's the eurozone. The eurozone is in danger of collapsing. So, it's affecting Wall Street. So at the end of the day, and when they are giving you those, those reports on Wall Street, do you pay attention or not? That's what's going to determine if you are going to continue going to school, and if when you get married, you are going to be able to buy a house, what's going to happen with your kids, you know? And it's not to get scared. It's that you can have control over all those things if you are a citizen and you learn about it. Because part of what we have to learn in these conferences is how to create policy and how to affect. So that you can have the world you want. Now, if you want a very individualistic world, don't do anything. Just wait. You know, and it's, the world is going to going down. And so you have to figure it out. If I say right now to you, Chile, what do I say? What, what, am I, what am I talking about if I say the word Chile? You know, right now, Chile, that word is a political statement. Hmm? Education. Exactly. Say it. Say that. The education. Mm -hmm. That's what? Big crisis in Chile right now. Uh huh. See what happens is Chile is a country. It's not you know how do you call those things Chile <laughs> from Catlin, you know. <laughs> Chile, that country, where a lot of the copper mines, you know, are uh, you know part of the transnational corporations that help to make a lot of the arms. So that is a relationship right there of policy and international and the finances and economic and economic situation. Yeah? But. What happened is that the young people in Chile, and go on Google, you're perfect at that, you know? Go on Google and find out. The young people, the, co the government decided to privatize the education. The young people studied it and discussed it, and they said, no, we cannot pay you know, to have an education that is not really assuring us quality of life. We want quality of life. And we mean for all kids and all young people all over the earth to have quality of education. So we got to get our government to have an education that is not for mindlessness, that is not about consumerism, but quality of life. And you know, they, 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 they developed their committee, and they have been able to stop the government. And the government is ready to collapse because the trade unions, the students, the parents, everybody's together with the students, even though they were, you know, shot at them, they, you know, they mistreated them in the streets. <coughs> and guess who's the president of that committee? Guess what? Who knows? It's a young woman, 23 years old. So the government decided, okay, we should get together and talk. It was supposed to be for this Tuesday, you know? And the young, woman, and the young woman called the press conference and said, yes, we are going to go and talk with the government, but it's not about negotiation. She sets the policy right there. And it's helping the whole world. Believe it or not, it's helping you too. Because, you know, because it comes all over. And you should learn from that and see how you should be in solidarity and learning about that movement. Remember the man was talking about people's movements? That's what he's talking about, the guy this afternoon. So, you know, because of the 
uh, financial and economic crisis, and because they were for, they are basically four big crises going on, and we are talking about international, right, and uh, and policies. So the financial and economic crisis, the food crisis, because the price of food has gone high, very very high, the, and is related also to the climate change crisis and it's related also to the energy crisis because they bring a lot of stuff from other states, you know? So these four crises have made life unlivable. So they decided the G8, really this, the G7 plus one, decided to go to the G20. <coughs> so who can name me some of the G20 countries? Hmm? Besides the US. It's your neighbor, Canada, uh huh? Uh, United Kingdom. Uh huh. Should I go on? Uh huh, you can. Um, Mexico. Uh huh. Uh, Italy. Uh huh. Germany. Uh huh. Uh, Austria. Uh huh. Guess I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> nice job, Tim. <laughs> but you know, you are not so done because at least you knew, right? What is important is that, you know, people have been pushing for the reform of the UN. So any economy and the emergent economies are coming into that group, you know. So for example, in terms of the continent of the Americas is Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina. And so, uh, you know, Spain was not in there because, you know, they have to compete with all these, you know, big economies the strongest economies in the world. Now, they keep telling you that Mexico is a mess and all these people are getting killed. Mexico is one of the G20, you know? Which is a problem for the rest of us in Latin America, not because they are bad. The, the, the people of Mexico are very solidarious, you know, they help a lot and all that. But it's a problem because then now they cannot be part of the G77. Do you know what the G77 is? Because this is all about policy. The G7 is checking, good. I didn't mention them before because it had, you know, everything gets to its point, right? The G77 is the group of the non aligned countries. And that was created in the time of the Soviet Union because, you know, the US was representing a paradigm and the Soviet Union a different paradigm, so it was the Cold War, and so they kept accusing. You know, Soviet Union and the U.S., especially the U.S., kept accusing those countries that were not part of, you know, their ages. They were accusing them of being part of the Soviet Union. And so the G77 got together and said, uh-uh, we have our own opinions. We are going to study situations. We are going to take positions and we are going to lobby for them. You know? And so Mexico was one of the creators of the G77, Philippines too, Pakistan too, Iran too, Iraq too, you know, the, uh, what was the Yugoslavia, you know, they were part of the G77. So they had their own ways of understanding and, you know, they lobby for their positions. Again, it's about creating policies. For example, in that kind of discussion, they develop things like the Convention of the Rights to self-determination, the Convention on the Right of People to Non-Intervention. You know, and all these things were created. I am telling you, it's really amazing how if you study this, then you can apply it to your daily life, and you can apply it to your uh, municipality and your church and all that, you know, because there is a lot of wisdom that people develop in there. So for us, it's a problem that Brazil Argentina and Mexico are not part of the G77 now, and they have to be with the G20s, figure out what to do in life, and, you know, we don't have their wisdom, and we don't have them with us any longer, you know, because that, that movement has been uh, weakened by not, by not having them there, you know, because they have to be on the other side. So we have to negotiate with them now. So the G20 included a bunch of other countries, and the major problem is that they are meeting regularly. So you check the G8 slash G20 and find out the meetings that they have had, what they have discussed, what <coughs> positions they've taken. So for example, when we ask them about what they're doing about the terrible, terrible problem with climate change, they say, no, we deal with uh, 
economics, finances. So that is for COP17. Seven, Do you know what COPs are? I'm not talking about the policeman. COP. COP17 is, you know, the series of meetings that happen every year with respect to climate. So they say, that's COP17, and they don't deal with that, but they don't go to those meetings and really negotiate. So the Kyoto Protocol is stopped because, you know, they don't want to deal with that because it's money related. Hmm? Or, for example, when we're talking about the food crisis, they say, no, we don't deal with that. That goes with the FAO. You know what the FAO is? <coughs> it's the part of the United Nations that deals with food and agriculture. So, you know, it's important that you really know all this because otherwise you are, you're just going to be a salaried person and life is going to be defined for you and your kids and your grandchildren and the grandchildren of your grandchildren. And you don't know where it's going to stop the way that it's going. So, you know, like I'm part of all those groups negotiating and figuring, but my position, even though that's not the position of everybody in this, group, in this uh, working group that I am, is, is not only to monitor and press the G20s and you know, check what they're doing, what their positions and all that. My position is that we have to do that so that we develop our own positions. What is it that we want? What's the world that we want? You know, what is the world that is needed? And then we have to work on all those policies. So for example, that's why I do a lot of work also on the Commission on the Status of Women, you know. And I work very hard in something that is called GEAR. G-E-A-R. The GEAR campaign we have had for five years, and it's a women's movement, and men, men join us, that are working in the refoundation and the reforming of the UN. So what we did is that we were able to get, you know, the major commissions or divisions that the UN had with respect to the status of women and women empowerment and all that to create UN Women, which is a unit of the UN that it has to work for the promotion, for the empowerment of women, for women's justice and equality, and girls too. And that was a big debate because, you know, many times, all the time in society, they see women as women and children. And then, you know, they go quickly into the children's situation and we don't deal with our needs and situations. So we have to struggle very hard. So finally, the UN Women was created, you know, and you can check what that is. And because, finally, because of the work of women and men that joined us in all the processes, it's many processes going on, but you have to have clarity, you know, and we have to show that unless there was women's justice, environment, equality, and the care of the environment, we would never have peace in the world and we would ne never really have development. And so the UN Women unit is not to have projects necessarily, but is to promote that in the, um, that the governments sign agreements, fulfill them. You know, monitor, push with women, you know, so that this happens. This is for the future. This, we are already manifesting a different future when we are doing that. The other thing is that you know it was it it, it helps to uh, the governments in situ to uh, advises them on how to go about women's equality and empowerment and all that. And the other thing is that it helps the governments to also monitor what the UN is doing in the totality of the UN. You know, in the system-wide process in terms of fulfilling women's empowerment. You know, and I, I, I encourage you to go and check all those things. So, you know, like in the G20s, we are pushing all these things too. But we have people's movements also, that when we are trying to create our own thing. So that's why I'm one of the three world co-chairs. And this is millions of people that are in these movements, you know. And, and the co-chairs, what, what we do is that uh, we have a, a movement that is called Global Call to action uh, on poverty, GCA. And, it's, uh, and now, right now, it's to really make sure that the MDGs, which is the Millennium Development Goals, you know, that are tools to figure out how to carry out the work so that we can have a millennium of justice and peace and development and a healthy planet, are fulfilled. And, you know, there is a, a date 
not to fulfill the totality of it, but for chances, you know. So the first time is 2015. See how far they have gone with the goals that we have had to buy country and, you know, worldwide. And so now we just started to discuss beyond 2015 how this movement is going to galvanize movement around the world so that, you know, like governments say, oh, young, it's 2015, all those crises didn't allow us to do this and that, so, you know, we just did this. No, we have to say beyond 2015. And in my case, I say beyond, beyond, because, you know, I'm not working for this generation or your grandchildren. I'm talking about the seventh generation as a system of understanding where we, we have to go. So, you see, I'm, I'm trying to give you some glimpse, the glimpses on these things that need to be done and how it can be done. And you have a great university. You can ask your professors to work with you on those things. And, you know, like, um, if you do some of your uh, Google things that you do, you'll find out. You and women, year campaign, you know, United Nations, the G20s, and all that. So here, you know, like you will say, well, how is that really working on the, you know, I see how, I think that you might have. I prepared something very, very tiny for you to, let's see, maybe, who's the person that, and anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. my point was, you know, and you saw it at the beginning, discerning development, security, and peace from a gender perspective. And I have given you all this. And you might say, oh, how many times she mentioned woman? Because the whole issue, the wholeness is ours. That's the gender perspective, you know, that it's not only about women and women and girls. It's about the totality. And we have to bring that forth. Okay, just go. Um, and after yeah. that, I have prepared something that is called the Millennium Development Goals. And in there, see, I have a museum. And you go and check it. And you see a lot of stuff in there. It's, uh, the, the website is www.museo. It's in Spanish, but you can see it in English too. But the, the website is museo, M-U-S-E-O, aha, E-J-E, dot org. And so, you know, like, the, this one that I have here, it was about the eight millennium development goals, and it has a great painting that I went, you know, did you see, I found this painter in Guatemala that is a native guy, and he lives in an island, and I went all over to look for him, and I said, I want something on food sovereignty. And he made this beautiful, beautiful painting, and I had a picture of right here. Um, but I'm going to leave this with them. And you know, if I were you, you know how? I don't let anything. I set up a meeting, and then I say, let's get together and discuss this, you know? Yes, you have a question? Have, uh, what's the website? www.museo, M-U-S-E-O, dot org. And you see all these things that we're doing, and we are having influence worldwide.
and there is disturbance, and don't, sometimes we put there information, things that you can read, you know, and give you hints on things that you can do on your own. Because we only, you know, it was okay. 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 The eight Millennium Development Goals, MDGs, are basic tools. You know, when we first got them, because this was an agreement in 2000 uh, at the United Nations, women got very angry because they said, oh, there's only one that mentions women. And I told them, it's about the millennium for everybody. It belongs to everybody. So all the people are discerning them, indigenous people are discerning them. Uh, for children, it's being discerned, people with uh, uh, differences are discerning them, you know. So, and this is the painting I was telling you about, see, that I did with this guy. I didn't paint it, I was just sitting with them and getting him in suits so that he would do it, right? And those are the various millennium development goals. And so the women were saying, see, promote gender equality and empower, empower women. So they thought, it's only one, and this is minimalist. I see the leverage, you know, it's leverage. So I started to work from the beginning. UN Women, the, new, the newly created unit of the UN to promote women's rights and benefits as a result of women's global work. You see? And so, Women United Nations, an entity for gender equality and the empowerment of women. And, you know, that's where women from all over the world, we have worked for five years in the GEAR campaign. GEAR is G-E-A-R, which is um, uh, gender, um, gender architecture reform. That's what GEAR means. And we're still working on that. And we are keeping our eye on Michelet, you know, the, new, the woman that is now the post -area. And this is Beijing Platform for Action, resulted from the UN World Conference of Women in Beijing 1995. And this is the commitment by governments for women or for women of the world. And then under that is the Commission on the Status of Women. There is, you know, this platform of action is fast up what needs to happen, you know, and it really affected all the world, you know, every country had to create an institution. Yes. Just to um, add on to what Mark said, these levels, the university has a commission on the status of women. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of keep your eye on that as well. Yeah, and so it, and it, it was for that, you know, and I was at that, at that in Beijing, and it was women from all over the world, it was about a half, hundreds of women, you know, but they were previous to that, and you know, in Mexico, in Nairobi, so I was doing all that, and if I, if I had to start to in, in, in order to go, I did it, you know, because I felt that this is important. The G8, G20, G193, G the G193 is all the countries of the world, right? And then I already told you the G8 and G20. The G8, G20 represents the current most powerful hmm, economies who meet periodically to decide how to move forward agendas that attempt to address the many crises the world has experienced to the detriment of watering down the work of the G193, the UN. And now look at this. In El Salvador, we have created the G50 or the G50, you know, in Spanish, <laughs> G50 is 50. The number is 50, but also not to keep the account is 50. We don't have, you know, how many are participating. So anybody that, uh, to move the citizenry to take initiatives that are in favor of the public goods and, public, and global public goods. So the public good is the good for humanity. Global public goods is air, water, mountains, and all that, okay? But you see the Seoul Summit 2010. I was there. And I tell you, I can tell you stories about that. But, uh, you know, like, that's why I'm telling you all the stories that I told you is because I have lived there, you know, with these guys and a few women there. The new international financial architecture, UN, UN Financing for Development. This is very important because it shows you where the resources are, economic resources, and it gives an analysis of how to move the resources, not only economic, but, you know, the best resources, the people of a nation. So the International Conference of the UN Financing for Development 
FFD, a global agreement to create a new financial architecture to prioritize people and planet, and happening March 2002, and that was in Monterrey, Mexico. Women and the Global South play a key role. This conference, they were not willing to have, but we fought and fought until we had. That's just that is a big study right there. What is it called? You see that sign there, Vámonos, Patria, Caminar, Yo Te Acompaño. This was written, it's a poem that was written by a young man from Guatemala, Otto René Castillo, who, uh, you know, said to his motherland, which is Guatemala, let's go, motherland, let's walk, I will walk with you. You know, you make, you know, a motherland, or you, you develop your nation as you work with it. So the goal is to develop ways for individuals in the global north to commit to the shift of paradigm of consumption to one of sustaining, uh, sustenance. It is urgent that we mobilize. The global north consumes and wastes the natural and economic resources of the world. The global south must work on mitigation and adaptation. We have to work together. That's just basic. You know, this has to be really understood clearly. Since we are the solution, we must create the conditions for all of us to be the solution, you know, because it is us that has created the world as we have it. This painting was created with a young man in the museum, uh, you know, on sustainable peace. And you see the woman is, is carrying, life is carrying the kids, and then there are some that are behind, you know, you know, coming to life. So it says, 23rd century is a social movement to manifest the future of peace now. Humans are creators, those create intentionally with each individual and collective act. The world we want and need for everyone, conscious of the seventh generation and the health of the planet. That's, that's our movement, 23rd century. And it's you know, to manifest now the future uh, world that we want. Sustainable peace is, uh, can only be sustainable. Peace can only be sustainable. Those durable if each person, personal and collective action manifested day in and day out. Choose to manifest peace today in your daily life. These are the paintings that you see on that we create, you know, as we talk about what, what kind of message we can give to people. And the reason that the museum is a folk arts and, you know, cultural museum, uh, and it's called AHA because, you know, we give the guided tours and then the people go around saying AHA. And thank you. Thank you.